So my talk is on why um, third world feminism matters, right? And so this past winter break, much like any other university student, I went back home. But home for me is a little further away. It is in Myanmar. You might know it as Burma. And more specifically, it is in Yango, the former capital. While I was there, my grandmother turned 72. And my grandmother also buried her mother on the very same day she blew out her candles. While my grandfather, her husband, was on a hospital bed and has been for the past two months. My grandmother has been holding together her family for years now. And while I was there, I realized just how abstract the concept of women empowerment really is by seeing my grandmother for who she is, an empowered woman. But Western feminists would not consider her so. My grandmother never finished high school. Instead, she got married at the ripe old age of 19 and by the time she was my age, 21, she already had two daughters and would continue to have two more in the near future. So my grandmother, growing up in the time that she did, when she was ingrained with beliefs that she is beneath, that she is beneath to support the needs of others, her siblings, her children, and her husband, she never questioned it when she was told that she was morally, intellectually, and physically beneath her male counterparts. And these beliefs are so pervasive that I grew up the exact same way, even though I was born two generations after her. I was told I was dirty because my body menstruates. I was told to never climb over boys during playtime because I would morally taint them with the filth within me. And I'll never forget when one of my most beloved teachers told me very, very matter-of-factly that boys are simply just better than girls. But unlike my grandmother, I never fully accepted it. I decided to leave Myanmar when I was 16 to attend boarding school in Singapore. And while I was there, I got to learn from an amazing woman who not only taught me that girls and women are equal to boys and men, but to never be afraid to stand up to those who think otherwise. It was there where I got my first taste of feminism and empowerment. I finally felt free and clean. And you know, I, I'm not afraid to admit that I am one of the lucky ones. I come from a background of immense privilege and my mother never put a cap on my goals. Instead, she always told me to aim for the stars when it came to pursuing my education and my passions. But during this pursuit, as I felt my voice grow louder and louder, and as I became even more and more educated, I also became ignorant. I forgot that education was only one route towards empowerment. I forgot that others who did not follow the same path as I did could be just as empowered as I was. Empowerment is within the many successful professional women of our time. Empowerment is within the words, me too. And empowerment is within the many women like my grandmother, who have fought back against patriarchy through ways such as religion and family ways that are invincible to Western feminists. But in the global feminist movement, it is the white Western woman's definition of empowerment that reigns supreme. 
Western women have been fighting for political rights, equal wage, sexual liberation, and please don't get me wrong, these are all incredibly, incredibly important. But these are just a few of the many ways towards empowerment. My grandmother may not fit the traditional Eurocentric view of an empowered woman, but she has found strength and agency through her family. As I watched her wipe away her tears at her mother's funeral, I also noticed for the very first time the determination in the very eyes that shed those tears. She has faced her many troubles with a spine of steel, but one that is wrapped up in all that is sweet and soft. She has had to make difficult choices later on in her life, but the very fact that she ultimately gained that ability is a testament to her empowerment. My grandmother may not have had a life similar to mine, but she is just as empowered. Once again, she is not an exception. She is the rule. She is just one of many women from around the world whose empowerment is not always so obvious. But just because it isn't obvious doesn't mean it isn't there. Yet, throughout Myanmar history, women have found ingenious ways to exercise their agency. In pre-colonial times, Myanmar queens used their relationship with kings to further their own personal and political agendas. In colonial times, though the British emphasized that women were to be civilized by becoming educated in domestic work so that you know, they can aspire to be the perfect housewives, women transcended the system by becoming prominent lawyers, writers, and doctors. And during the military regime, women who were told to stay at home took to the streets, demanding democratic freedom. These systems did everything they could to ensure that the glass ceiling stood firmly in place, but these women found ways to jump over it. Yet, even decades after the fall of colonialism, the white man's burden persists. The first world lumps together the many, many different women of the third world as victims. Such an outlook is not only ignorant, it is also inefficient and harmful. I travel often between these two worlds. And sometimes when I take a step back, it almost seems surreal. One day, I could be grounded firmly in this one, talking openly about the effectiveness of IUDs with my fellow Planned Parenthood members. And the next, I find myself reverting back to my roots in a heated discussion about the karmic repercussions of abortions. You know, sometimes it does give me whiplash. It's very nauseating. But I have come to learn that both of these conversations are equally important and valid. It is impossible to anchor yourself when navigating between these different types of feminisms. Instead, what we must push ourselves to do is see better to look beyond the surface of oppression so that you can see the layers of empowerment beneath. So to everyone who is fighting, fighting against oppression, inequality, and injustice, remember that you are not responsible and that it is impossible to give voices to those who have been silenced. What you can do is amplify the voices they already have within them. To do so, you must listen. Please listen. Listen to the stories that are not told on the pages of the New York Times. Listen 
for the quiet resilience of those who have seen and experienced suffocating oppression. And listen, because we simply don't do that enough. And by listening, instead of solely speaking, you will begin to recognize that empowerment comes in many shapes and forms from the first world and beyond. Thank you. <laughs>